Now I have to stand back here because supposedly the way the Christmas tree is and everything, the lights can't move forward. So I just know I'm going to trip over this. So when I do, you're welcome to laugh, okay? Um, how many of you actually made a New Year's resolution? How many? Wow, most of you have just given up, right? I mean, just like, ah, that's not even worth it anymore. It, would anyone admit that the resolution that they made, they have already failed? Anybody? Oh, wow, people actually, yeah. You know, I, I just made a resolution today. At 4 a.m. my time, the little beepy of a fire alarm started happening. You know, the one where it's like you, didn't, you need to replace a battery sort of beeping? Except it never happens at 2 p.m. in the afternoon or, you know, 6 p.m. in the evening. It's always, like, really early in the morning. And it was, and so I went up and I had to change that. So here's my New Re Year's resolution. By the end of this year, I will change the rest of them. Um, I don't know when that is. And you, you know, there are times when we've made resolutions to just, in some ways, we consider, like, be better people. Like, I know people that I've been around at times have said, I am making a resolution to be more patient this year. And then, you know, I'm in the car with them as they're driving and somebody gets in their way and it's like, ah, yeah, yeah, right? And, and, and maybe you're one of these who've, who've made that resolution or you've, you've tried, to, I'm going to be more patient. And then you get in line somewhere and it's like, why can't these people hurry up? Um, you know, and I used to think that was just a young person's problem till I moved out to Arizona and got in line at Walmart, and folks, I'm just here to tell you that the 60, 70, 80 year old people are just as impatient now as we were as young people. Why is that though? Have you ever considered, you know, sometimes we make this statement, oh Lord, I'm going to pray for patience, and then we say, well, I prayed for patience, and then God tested me, and, and, I, and I suffered through this impatient thing. Well, you know what tests do? They don't make you more patience, they just reveal that you have none. I mean, if that were true, then every one of us who are of age 50 and older, we would be so patient, but yet we're not. Why? Because patience, true patience, is something that only God's Spirit can change our nature for. And so the, this, this year, last year was the year of provision, and oh, did God provide in so many ways. And this year is a year of discipleship. And, and we're going to be talking about and, and, and really encouraging discipleship through this whole year, all kinds of discipleship. Because the fact of the matter is, this last year we grew by over 100 people on Sundays. And that's great. That's awesome. But the fact is, we can grow in numbers and still not grow in discipleship. We, we can grow and, and we just have more people who aren't really true disciples and aren't growing in their discipleship. And so we want to really emphasize this year the discipleship factor of what a church is supposed to be. It's not just to worship, it's to disciple one another. And so we're going to start in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20, which is one of the most famous verses that most of you who've been in you know, church for a long time, you probably have this memorized. And it says this, go, therefore, go and make disciples. Now this is Jesus in kind of his last, like, encouragement to his disciples. He's telling them this. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now the problem is, is we use the word discipleship in so many different ways. And we talk, you know, in Christianese, in churches, we'll say disciple, discipleship, and, and we don't really completely maybe understand what Jesus was talking about when he said, go make disciples. And so probably the best thing we can do as we begin today is to declare what was a disciple during Jesus' time? What would those 12 have understood a disciple was? And then how in our present day and age can we take that and say, well, how do I become a disciple? So I want to kind of walk through um, the education of a Jewish young child through the point where they might actually become a disciple so that we can catch what Jesus may be talking about. Now, in the first century, uh, all along, all the way from back in Deuteronomy, 
uh, Moses had declared that God told them, hey, you teach your children all these things. You, you teach them, you bind it on their foreheads, you know, all these things. You do it. You make sure they know. And, and, and by the first century, what they actually decided to do is for the first time, they started educational systems. That in each small town, there would be local rabbis, local teachers, who their goal, yes, they would talk, they'd teach other things, writing and stuff, but their main goal was to teach the things of God. And so from age like five to six to nine, like that age time, that as you would go, the first thing you did is the written Torah. You would learn the written Torah. In fact, you would memorize at least the first five, what we would call first five books of the Bible, but the first five scripture passages that they received from God. And there were at the time as many as 24, like some of the prophets and some of the ones, all the ones we have in the Old Testament, not all of them, but many of them. And they were told to, to memorize them, to learn them. They would talk about them. And that was the first four or five years of their education. And, and the, the issue is sometimes for us, to be honest with you, it, it was a knowledge-based originally thing where they were learning the scriptures and what it said. And, and the danger for that, and some of us as we're young believers, we get all into Bible studies and all this stuff. But the danger is, is that we know a lot, but we don't understand how to live that. We don't understand the fullness of wisdom and experience and what it means and the totality of Scripture. And so the next kind of three to four years from like 10 to 13, they had the oral Torah. And what that would be is the rabbi would, would walk them through. Now, they didn't have a teacher just stand up and say, okay, children, this is what you need to know. He asked questions. The way they did it in, the, in that time is they would just constantly ask questions about well, what do you think, if you were to be in this situation, understanding this scripture, how would you act? What would you do? You know, think about it from just a really practical side of, we can know and memorize all the scripture, but how does it really play when I'm, you know, with my neighbor, with my friend, with my family member, in line behind 20 people who seem to like have no, nothing else to do, right? What, what, how should I be? What should I do? And, and so, um, you know, the danger, by the way, of, of ending here sometimes can be what we know as the Pharisees, because they would ask, well, how do I keep the Sabbath? They knew they needed to keep the Sabbath. How do I keep the Sabbath? And the, you know, it got to be where some Pharisees created so many rules, extra rules, to keep the Sabbath. They're doing it for good reasons, but we see Jesus coming up against that, right, in different ways. How do I keep this out? How do I love God with all my heart, soul, and mind? What does that mean? Well, you know, they would, different rabbis would say, you got to do this and this and this. But the idea was to somehow come to a, a, an ability for someone not to only know the scriptures, but to live it. And then at 13, most children and all females, at that time only males could become disciples, but most children would go home and would apprentice or whatever their parents did or whatever they were going to do eventually for work, they would go. And only a very few who felt like they had done really well and wanted to apply to one of the rabbis to be their disciples could go forward. And they would apply, but that doesn't necessarily mean the rabbi would take them. The rabbi would walk them through and talk to them and see if they had it in them. Because here's the key. The rabbi, in order to take a disciple, would say, I believe this disciple can do what I do and be who I am. And that was serious business. And in fact, a disciple would basically be signing their life away and saying, by saying I'm going to be under you, Rabbi, I am completely giving up my own will to you. Anything you tell me to do, I will do. And look, part of what a, a disciple might be, especially the, at the beginning stages of a disciple, you might be the one who has to go into the next town and get something, get food or whatever. I mean, you, you were in some ways, you know, a servant of the rabbi. Now, can you hear what a disciple was? Let's see what Jesus described a disciple in uh, Matthew chapter 16, verses 24. He says this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. What is he saying? Well, we talked, 
you know, two weeks ago about lordship, essentially it's the same thing. It's the idea that we must say, not my will, but your will. Not my way, but your way. Denying my things first, and, and Jesus takes it even a step further than the rabbis, because essentially when he's talking about the cross, that's an implement of death, and he's saying, and, and Paul actually writes this in Romans 12, that you have to die to yourself. Get on the altar. And so to be a disciple, to understand it from, from the day and age of Jesus, and what he's calling us to is to understand to truly walk as a disciple means his will, not ours. Meaning I am serious about falling under his authority and everything he has. So in order to really move forward, there, there are two things that we have to recognize that we need in order to walk a path of discipleship. Are you ready? The first one is the Holy Spirit. And the reason why I say that, remember when it says, go and make disciples and do what? Baptize them. What, what does that signify? Signify salvation. And what do we know happens when we are saved? We receive the Spirit of God. You can't be a disciple of Christ without being saved. And you can't have the Holy Spirit without being saved. So in order to be a disciple, we need the Spirit. And the other thing that we need is the Word. Those two things, without those two things, there's no way to be a disciple. If you're here today and you go, oh yeah, I'm saved, my question is, are you a disciple? You might have the Holy Spirit, but where are you in his word? Because between those two things, when you read his word and when you're in his word and, and when you're talking about his word and when you have the spirit, you know what happens? Your nature changes. See, we can change, we can temporarily change what we do. We can say, I'm going to be more patient. And we can, in our own self-discipline, try to do that. And, and we might be successful at times. But to truly be a disciple and be changed and to look more like our rabbi. By the way, there's only one rabbi. I'm not your rabbi. You know, the most famous Christian of all is not your rabbi. You know who your rabbi is? It's Jesus. He's all of our rabbis. Every one of us, that's our ultimate teacher. That's our master, which only reinforces that we need his spirit and we need his word in order to change like him. So in order to walk out, we have to first understand that it is absolutely necessary that you are saved to be a disciple, but it is also absolutely necessary that you must have his word. And you can see the importance from the traditional understanding of what a disciple would be. He would have already gone through all of the word of God at the time. He would have already gone through not only the word of God, but how to live the word of God before he even applied. In the same way, without the word of God, you can't be a disciple. I mean, I think we kind of take, you know, we have our Bibles and and now we don't even bring them to church because we got it right here, right? Um, but we used to at least pick them up for church. But the question is, is how often do you at least open your Bible app? And, and I don't mean read like the one verse of the day and what somebody else says. How often are you in his word? Because the disciple is going to be in his word with his spirit. And that's what's going to change us. It's, it's nothing else. Like I said, we can try to live what God's called us to, but we can't really change to what God's called us to apart from those. So I want to talk about a couple of steps in order to, uh, that we take as disciples as you move forward. And, and the first step we, we, we know in 1624 um, where it says deny yourself, the first step that I would say is willing, be willing. And what I mean by that is be willing to give up what you want for what he wants. Like when God speaks to you or encourages you or through a message reveals to you that maybe, just maybe, golf four times a week is more than you should be golfing because you could spend that time in other productive ways. I'm not saying the number, but I'm just saying pickleball. I know some of you like, just don't say pickleball. Um, Whatever it is that 
we enjoy. God, God's not asking us to, you know, never do what we enjoy. But sometimes what we enjoy takes priority. So we are no longer disciples. We are disciples of ourselves. We follow what we want. But we are not disciples of Christ. Be willing means no matter what he calls us to, we say yes. Ugh. Right? I mean, think about all the things he could be calling us to or might call you to this year. Especially since this year is a year of discipleship for our whole body. If you're a part of the church at Sun Valley, God's probably calling you to some things. You know, next, next Sunday we're having our, our uh, one of the Brazilian missionaries we're going to go to brazil this summer and he's going to give the message and then afterwards we're going to have a a lunch to to answer questions you know what through that time and maybe even right now god might be going that's something you need to consider you've never really gone outside the country you need to consider that and our nature might go well not me i'm too old um you know i i couldn't find something to eat there by the way it's chicken beef rice you know you've eaten that beans you know, it, it's all these excuses. We, I don't like to fly. I don't, you know, all the excuses we put in front of because we're not ready to say, your will, not my will. I am, have you ever just sat down with God and said this? I'm willing to do whatever you want. It's scary. I'm willing to do whatever you want. I know um, Bob preached on prayer and prayers that, that we sometimes don't want to pray. You know, that's a prayer and a, and, and a question we should ask is, God, what do you want me to do? I'm willing to do whatever you want. And that's the first step of the disciple because essentially like discipleship back then was you signed a pledge that this was it. You were doing whatever the rabbi asked. And if you read, you know, the passage, deny yourself, take up your cross, Jesus is saying the exact same thing. In order to really be his disciple, we have to say, your will first, my will second. So be willing. The second thing is, be prepared. You know, God doesn't just call us to be a disciple, he calls us to do what? Make disciples. And, and some of us, to be honest with you, if I was to ask right now, and I'm not going to, do you have a plan to disciple someone in your life, how many in your heart would you be able to raise your hand and say, yes? That I can take all that I've been given and all the discipleship that I've had from small groups to, to mentors to, you know, messages in every way that I've been discipled, can I take that and can I disciple someone else? Can I lead them towards Christ? Can I say what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1? He says, and you should imitate me. He's talking to the Corinth church. He says, you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Now that word imitate actually is emulate in the meaning. It's a Greek word mimic. But it's not mimic exactly like act like them. I mean... None of us could act exactly like Christ, and none of us could act exactly like anyone else. Like, I could tell you to imitate me, and, and you'd, like, throw your arms around and do all these crazy things. But um, the fact is, if you're not gifted in the same way I am, you're never going to completely imitate me. But emulate means that I pattern my life after them. And what Paul says is, to the, to the Corinthians, he says... You've seen me because I've patterned my life after the rabbi, so you can trust and pattern your life after me. He was prepared to offer that. How many of us today could say, even the little bit, maybe you've just become a believer, but you know enough to be saved. Are you making disciples? Are you telling your family? Are you telling your friends? Do you have a, are you prepared to disciple others? What's your plan? I think we, we just kind of go through life and we hope that discipleship happens. And, and there is a, a part of that, that as I go, a, as I fo you follow my example, emulate me, um, we're putting that out there when we're with a group that are golfing or whatever. Maybe we're living in a life, we golf with them all the time and we try to live and speak in a way that is encouraging to them and shows them Christ. But are you prepared to actually disciple? Do you have plans? Do you, do you know? One of the things I, I encourage 
our people to do, and, and you hear me talk about it occasionally, is the one-on-one -on -one discipleship. And, and the reason why isn't because this is the silver bullet of all discipleship. It's because some of us don't even have a tool. So if God was to say, hey, go disciple your neighbor or go disciple your family, or go, we wouldn't know how to even start. Do you have a tool? You know, our tool isn't necessarily better than any tool, but do you have a tool? Do you have a plan? Are you prepared? A true disciple and a true discipler is prepared. And then a true disciple, so you're willing, you're prepared, and you're purposeful. You know, it's great to be prepared, but now I've got to go. Now I've got to actively say, how am I going to be discipled? Where am I going to put myself in a place where I'm being discipled? You know, uh, for some of you, if you're visiting with us, you know, I would say find a church that preaches the scriptures and teaches the gospel and, and has ways for you to be discipled. And, and I know the church at Sun Valley, that's what we do. But whether it's here or anywhere else, the, the true measure of a church is not whether you really have a good time on Sunday. It's whether you're different on Monday. And, and to be purposeful in being discipled, finding places to be discipled, and then purposefully in discipling others. Some of us, to be honest with us, we've got so much knowledge. We've been to every Bible study. We've, we've gone through every book of the Bible. We might have even done, you know, read the whole Bible in a year. Who's in it? You know, read the whole. That's great. How do you take what's been given you and take it to others? I mean, that's... that's that's the real key is as we walk out, we need to be purposeful. We need to plan not only to be discipled, but to disciple. And look, I know some of us, you know, we're not at that place where we've read all the Bible or where we've heard all the sermons or where we've gone to small groups forever. We're, we're not there. In fact, maybe you would say, I feel like what I've got right now is a thimble. Well, you know what? You know what, you know what would be a stewardship of the thimble that God's given you? To pour that out to someone. To be prepared to give that to someone. Maybe you only have two lessons you really have caught so far in your life. Are you prepared to pass that on to the people around you? And look, it's not necessarily discipleship doesn't always run downhill where the person with the most information is the one discipling. Here's what I know. Currently I have some different discipleships I'm doing and one of God's called me to is there's a young man that I'm walking through and we're doing a chapter a day together and we meet once a week and we talk about what we learned in each of those chapters or what we heard. And you know what's cool is, as much as I'm discipling him, I'm still hearing from God because the Spirit of God is in him and the Word of God he's read. And so when he speaks, sometimes God speaks through him and I hear God in a new way, in a different way. I'm still being discipled. I think we always think discipleship has to run downhill. But the reality is, is what's really changing you isn't some person's words, it's the Spirit and the Word. Amen? And so, someone doesn't have to be a pastor to do that. You can do that what little anyone knows. If you know, if you became a Christian and you know the gospel, you have something to pass on. Go and make disciples. You know, the scary part is this, though. <laughs> One of my mentors, actually Mike Perkinson, he told me something, because I was early on as being a senior pastor, I was a little frustrated with a couple people, and he said, you know what? He said, uh, disciples often look like their discipler. So if you're having problems with someone that you're discipling, perhaps they've become a little bit like you. I mean, that's just the truth of it. We're not all going to be perfect. The fact is, sometimes, sometimes we can tell where we need to be discipled when we get frustrated with people we're currently discipling and we realize, oh, I'm not quite there yet either. So there's dangers, but you know what? The, the reality is, is we have to go. We have to go. So I want to finish with this, some active steps that you can take today or this coming month to walk this out. Because I don't want you to just leave and go, okay, yep, I need, to, I need to be a disciple. I need to go make disciples. La, 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 la. It'd be a waste of your time and mine. 
So I want you to think of some way, and this isn't the only list, but I want you to think of ways that before you leave to say, I'm at least going to do one thing to be a disciple, and then I'm going to do one thing to begin to start preparing at least to make a disciple. So like I said, one of the things I really encourage is our one-on-one discipleship. And, and it's an opportunity. Uh, uh, we have somebody, normally somebody who's gone through it already, and, and they're ready to take someone else through it, and you meet together, and you go through uh, 18 weeks, and it's not, it doesn't have to be 18 weeks in a row. Most of the time, I'll just be honest, it usually takes, you know, three quarters of a year to get through between schedules and stuff. But it's an opportunity to talk about the foundational things. It really lays out what I would consider like the foundation of, of what God would have us. If you say a believer, a starting believer is A and like Paul is Z, it kind of gets us to M where you can at least have a foundational idea of what God's calling you to in, in different ways and who God is. Um, we offer that. I'm also, this coming spring, every Monday, in, starting in February, and you'll get more information about this. If you've already been through it, and maybe you've gone through the discipleship, but you're like, I don't feel comfortable necessarily discipling someone else, awesome, come to the class, I'm going to take all those who've already been discipled and walk through and reemphasize and help ask, answer questions and kind of how I disciple through the material. So you'll have an opportunity to participate in that if you would like. But, but that's one option, is the one-on-one -on -one discipleship. I'd love for everybody in the body to eventually have gone through it. Um, you know, the other kind is, that they actually had, at the time, the disciples of one rabbi. They'd have a, a group of them, and, and they were yeshivas. And they, what they did is they would take the scripture, and once again, it wasn't just the rabbi teaching it. He would have them kind of talk about it and, 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 and kind of... Uh, discuss it and even in some ways argue about it to grow in knowledge and the understanding well we would call that maybe small groups or bible study where you and, and at the end of the bible study you get together you talk about those things you discuss them together iron sharpens iron the bible says you know what can i tell you something i know this is scary you could be wrong and it's okay you know sometimes we harden a position we're like you're never gonna you, you, can, you can learn from others. So we have small groups coming up in January. We're going to reemphasize those. We have Bible studies, women's, and, and the men's Bible studies called Tim's. And it's, it's a way to not only get together uh, and talk, but also share life. Because I know men love to share life with one another. It's okay. <laughs> Your wife's are like, my husband never talks to me. Well, the good news is he gets encouragement there and they get to be able to share true life together. That's a great thing, men. If you haven't been a part, you can be a part of a Tim's group. You know, and, and we give opportunities to practice what we learn. You know, we serve together. And sometimes I have people go, why do we do these events? You know, I've had one person ask at a time, say, you know, we're, we're trying to build a building. Why do we spend money on these events? Well, twofold. One, because it's the vision of our church that God's given us. God says, uh, inviting our neighbors to taste and see that the Lord is good. If we do nothing to invite our neighbors to taste and see that the Lord is good, then it doesn't matter if we have a building, another tool, we're not doing his, his vision for us. Okay, that's the first thing. But the second thing, it enables us as a body to serve together. We practice discipleship. You know, one of, remember one of the things, the most famous things that Jesus did as the rabbi to his servants? I mean, to his disciples? He served them and then said, do as I do. That didn't end there. In fact, as they went about, you'll see over and over in the scriptures that Peter writes and you see in John, they talk about serving. So together we practice it. We practice it in serving. We practice it, you know, discipling one another. We practice it. We give you opportunities to practice. This, this morning... I really want to just finish with just an encouragement not to leave without making a decision to be a disciple and to make disciples. That's the core of what we're called to do. I mean, we can come every Sunday and worship and song and worship and listening and worship and reading scripture, but in the end, you're not really a disciple if you're not following him all the time. And the way we do that and learn that and, and, and it received that is from one another. God made it that way. And so I just want to encourage you, don't leave here without making a decision 
to be a disciple and to disciple others. And to try, and if you're confused and you're still wondering, we would, Pat and I would love to talk to you if, you if you still want some ideas. But please understand what God's calling you to and what God's calling us to as a body this year is to discipleship. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I just want to I just want to pray and bless you this morning. Lord God, bless all the people here and online. Give us eyes to see where we may become better disciples. Give us ears to hear what our master is calling us to know and do. Give us hearts that are willing to go and do whatever you ask, even when that presses us into give up, giving up something of value to us. Help us trust that what we will receive from your spirit, both internally and externally, is infinitely better than what we have now. And form us into the pattern of our master, Jesus Christ. That we may be better disciples and more prepared and more purposeful for your name and for your glory. Amen.